Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Um, if you uh, are here in person and you would like to know what's happening at Redeemer, make sure you got one of these uh, bulletins. It kind of tells you everything. You should look through all of it. You don't have to read it all while I'm doing my sermon, though that's probably the best time. Um, but do look at all of it. It has some important announcements, so I'm not going to repeat them here. Also inserted are notes for the sermon later on. So um, if you like to fill in the blanks or look at Bible verses in the same translation that I'm using, uh, go ahead and grab one of these. If you are currently watching online, welcome. Thank you digitally for being here. And uh, you can find these same things on our website or on our Facebook page, the same uh, area that you got to us on video. You can pick these up as well. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for calling us to the most important mission ever. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us this morning and everything we do and say would be glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Every time I face the waves, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear it roar. 
I don't want to fear the storm. I don't want to fear the storm. Peace be still, say the word, and I will set my feet upon the sea till I'm dancing in the deep. Peace be still, you are here, so it is well, even when my eyes can't see. I will trust the voice that speaks. I'm not going to be afraid because these waves are only waves. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to fear the storm. You are greater than its roar. I'm not going to fear the storm. I'm not going to fear it all. Peace be still, say the word, and I will set my feet upon the sea till I'm dancing in the deep. Peace be still, you are here, so it is well. Even when my eyes can't see, I will trust the voice that speaks. Peace. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. 
When you fill the room, your rest on us. Come rest on us. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're beginning can control what tomorrow will bring but I know here in the middle is a place where you promise to be I'm not in Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Because all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? through the valley let your love rise above every fear like the sun shaping the shadow in my weakness your glory appears I'm not enough Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Because all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Sing, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. Unless you come, will you meet me here again? All I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again?
The Lord is in this place. Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, drive on the waken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Hallelujah. Have a seat. Whew. What a wonderful morning so far. Wow. Um, you know, we're part of the covenant denomination, and I go to conferences every once in a while, and uh, they talk to us pastors and say, hey, you should do this, you should think about that. And uh, on my road to ordination, which is hopefully coming up this summer, um, this coming summer, actually, like in seven months. That's not next year. Okay, okay, Heather's right, next year. Anyway, it's the first July that we'll come to. Hopefully that's the one that I'm ordained at. But part of that process, they said, you know, every covenant pastor should have uh, what we call a spiritual director, which is kind of a built-in mentor, someone that can kind of help me with bill things uh, or family things or church things. It's not someone in the church and someone kind of accessible. And uh, when I thought about all the, the people I would like to have that kind of input into my life, uh, I, I, I thought about Billy Graham, but he's gone now, and uh, he was unavailable. So uh, I asked Bill Anthes, and he said yes. And uh, so I'm really blessed that Bill uh, is a mentor to me now. We were meeting this past week, and talking about things, and he asked me, uh, Bill, wh what's happening at Redeemers? What's on your heart? What can we pray for? What, what do you want to see happen? And I thought about it, and I thought, you know, th what I'd really like to see right now uh, is more of our people coming back and worshiping in person. Yeah. Uh, I understand a lot of people are watching online, people that may not have even ever stepped foot in this building are watching online, and that's cool, uh, but I do miss seeing the faces of my friends who came here. And then he quoted a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the guy who wrote uh, The Cost of Discipleship. Uh, tremendous writer, tremendous guy. And this was the quote he told me. Well, he tried to tell me, and then he had to actually text it to me later to get the wording right. It says, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. And that's, that's exactly how I'm feeling. I'm going to read it again. The physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. So if you're watching online, thank you for watching online. Uh, but I would love it even more if you came and watched in person, participated, uh, worshipped with us. There's something about worship when we're doing it all together, which is really cool. Um, when... I don't want to step way too far ahead of my sermon, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about, um, never mind, I'll just wait for that. But first, I want to read a, a children's story to you. Once upon a time, there was a town called, and in Gopherville, there's a gopher named, well, here is something you should know. 
Silly Sally, Gilly Gally's sister, can be stubborn. Her parents first noticed this when she was a baby. When she was old enough to eat real food, she wouldn't let anyone spoon it into her mouth. She wanted to grab the food with her hands and feed herself. As you can imagine, it was usually a mess. Before she was old enough to go to school, she watched Gilly Gally go to school in the mornings, and she decided she wanted to go too. One day, she snuck out and followed Gilly Gally to school. He got so frustrated with her, he told her to go back home, but she wouldn't, and finally, he had to walk her all the way back home and give her back to mother, and he was tardy that day. When she was old enough to go to school, she used to sit in a different seat every day. It was only kindergarten, but the other kids would get confused on where to sit, and Silly Sally would just look at them and smile. She wasn't a mean girl, but she sure was stubborn. On the first day of first grade, there was a new girl gopher in the class. No one knew her yet because her family had just moved to Gopherville. She came and sat down right next to Silly Sally. Hi, my name is Sylvia Stubbins. What's your name? My name is Silly Sally. Are you the new girl from Indiana? Yes, how did you know? My brother heard your family was in town and found out how old you were, and I thought you might be in our class. It's nice to meet you. Silly Sally and Sylvia got along very well all morning long. Then there was lunch, and the two girls sat together. They talked about their brothers and parents and church and school, and then came recess. Silly Sally played with her friends at recess, and Sylvia made new friends and played with them. Silly Sally decided to swing across the monkey bars. She climbed up one side and then grabbed the first bar with her hand. Sylvia just happened to have the same idea at the same time, and she climbed up the ladder on the other side and started the cross. They met in the middle. Sylvia, you'll need to drop off so I can finish going across the bars. But Silly Sally, I think I was up here first, so you should drop off. Oh, I'm pretty sure I was up here first, Sylvia. Now please drop off. But I'm the new girl, and I think it would be very polite if you dropped off. By now, all the other gopher kids on the playground were gathered around the monkey bars to see what would happen. Most of them thought Silly Sally would end up winning, but some of them were secretly hoping Sylvia would win. Silly Sally's arms were starting to hurt. Sylvia, I'm not going to drop off, so you should drop off right now. Sylvia strengthened her grip on the bar that she was hanging from. Silly Sally, I will not drop off, so be a good girl and drop off. By now, the teachers had come over to see what all the kids were looking at. When they realized what was happening, they decided to wait and see. So that started the great Gopherville monkey bar hangoff. Silly Sally stared right in Sylvia's eyes, and Sylvia bit her lip as she hung on for dear life. The students started cheering. The teachers were laughing. Even though the two girls were stubborn and determined, neither one was mean, so neither one thought about kicking the other one with their feet. No, their feet just hung down like willows on a weeping willow tree. Minutes went by, then more minutes. Silly Sally's arms were feeling hot and her fingers were getting a little sweaty, but she just kept tightening her grip. She said to Sylvia as calmly as she could, are your arms feeling tired, Sylvia? My arms feel as happy as a banana split with extra whipped cream. Of course, she was not telling the truth. Her arms felt more like whipped cream melting on a hot sidewalk. Then Sylvia's eyes got really big, and she drew in a breath like you, see, you do when you see something scary. Silly Sally, is that a spider? And she was looking right down on Silly Sally's blouse. Silly Sally dropped off and started wiping her blouse off with her hands to get the spider off as fast as she could. Meanwhile, Sylvia walked across the rest of the bars and climbed down the other side. Soon, Silly Sally realized there was no spider on her blouse. Hey, there was no spider on me, she said loudly. Oops, my mistake, said Sylvia, and she raised her arms to the sky like she had just won the Olympics. The kids cheered and the teachers laughed. Everyone started walking back to the classroom. Silly Sally was mad. Then she started to think about the trick with the spider, and she realized that she was mostly mad because she didn't think of it first. She walked over to Sylvia. You're a pretty smart gopher, she said to Sylvia. And you're the strongest gopher I know, Sylvia said as they walked toward the building. Well, maybe the second strongest, and she laughed. Silly Sally laughed too. Well, let's see if you're the fastest, and the two girls took off running for the building. The end. We are in the middle of a long series called Who We Are, and it's about uh, identifying what I call redeemer distinctives. What is it that 
our church adds to the mix of the body of Christ? What is it that, that we want to focus on or excel in? What is it that uh, m- people would refer to our church and say, oh, that's the church that blank? And uh, I've been giving us a number of things that I identify in our current church right now that I think we're doing well in that, that uh, make us look more like Jesus. And then there are some things that I've identified that I think maybe we're not excelling in them yet, but I'm really praying that we do. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and review all the ones that we've talked about so far and then uh, finish the one that I started last week. All right, and I'm not going to read a a paragraph about each one. I had done that before, and by the time I got started on something new, it was perfectly time to go. So I'm just going to give you the the fill-in-the-blanks, although I think I filled in the blanks for you, didn't I? Man, I'm just enabling, aren't I? Y'all can be lazy today. It's all right. I filled in the blanks for you. So here we go. Um, Every church has a set of values that express its unique priorities and cultures. This list is meant to reflect our church's culture and values. Number one. We are pursuers of God. Number two, we are Bible believers. Number three, we are worshipers. Number four, we are part of the body of Christ. And you might say, well, that's a given. All churches are part of the body of Christ. But I put that in there because we know that we're only part of the body of Christ. We're not the whole body of Christ. We're not, you know, the center of attention for God. God His eyes go to and fro through the earth. He sees all the churches, and we're part of the body of Christ. We acknowledge our brother and sister churches all around us. All right, number five, we are mercy-driven, humble folks. Number six, we are equippers of the real workers. Raise your hand if you're a real worker. Was anybody here when I did that week? Okay, good, because you all are the real workers. It said God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So you all are the saints. Time for the works of service. I'm an equipper. All right. Uh, Number seven, we are family. Number eight, we are generous. Number nine, we are authentic. We are authentic. We don't just put on a show on Sunday morning. Uh, We are authentic. Number 10, we are risk takers. I told you I think that we should spell faith, R-I-S-K. If you're not going beyond your comfort zone, you're not growing in your faith. We are risk takers. Number 11, we are people of hope and faith. Number 12, we are respectful servants. And number 13, what I started last week, is that we are farsighted. And I I gave you the picture of when you need glasses, when you go to the optometrist or the optimist or uh, an optimist, whatever they're called, uh, they test you out, and they might have you read something far away. Can you read the top line? Can you read the bottom line? Blah, blah, blah. And then they put something right in front of your eyes and say, okay, can you read the top line? And what they're doing is they're figuring out if your eyes are better at seeing something far away or seeing something very close. Um, most of us, as we get older, uh, we have trouble seeing things close. Hence, they have reading glasses. So you put on your glasses when you want to read like this, or else you find me reading, you know, like this, trying to find a better light or something like that. Uh, So I would be farsighted. Well, as Christians, we are farsighted, or should be. It says we see beyond today and tomorrow. We look to the eternal kingdom of God, and that focus calls us to sacrifice short-term pleasures for long-term gains. While this world chases after an increase of riches and pleasures, we look to build and expand the kingdom of God, and the church. And these are the blanks that we had last week. We have two natures, or some, in some translations of the Bible, it might say we, have, we are of two minds. Uh, the sinful nature is self-centered and pleasure-centered. That's our sinful nature. We have two natures, and don't say, oh, I only have a good nature. Oh, sorry, guy, I know you better than that. We have two natures. One is the sinful nature, the self, it's self-centered and it's pleasure-centered. The other is other-centered. This is our spirit nature or the the spirit part of us. We are others-centered and character-centered. Christians know that death is a door, not a cliff. Christians know that death is a door and not a cliff. And this is one of the big differences between uh, those who are saved uh, in the kingdom of God and those who are not. In that if you talk to people in this world, 
they'll often talk about death as being the end. I want to do all I can before I die. You know, eat, drink, and be merry, and then we're going to die. And, and at every funeral, everybody's sad because that person, in some people's minds, is just gone. Well, that's not what we believe as Christians. For us, death is not the end. Death is a door. And, you know, as a Christian, um, nobody sh- wants to, like, rush to death. It's like, um, what is that song? Or somebody said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. So I get that. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Um, so we, now I'm completely thrown off. I have to start over. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> One of the beautiful things that Christians can do at funerals, especially pastors who are performing the funeral, is to help people think the big thoughts. What's going to happen to you when, when your body's in a box like this? Where are you going to be? Shouldn't you be approaching God now rather than waiting until you stand before his judgment seat? Uh, funerals are probably the best time for a pastor to evangelize, which I try to do at every opportunity. Um, also, because I believe that a death is a door and not a cliff that we just fall off of. Um, I am not afraid of dying. And I, whenever I preach on worship, I'll usually tell you that uh, it's always been my thought that the best time to die as a human being would be during a worship service. Because you can just like slide right into heaven and you don't even have to stop singing. You can just sing your way right up there and then you join in with the angels and stuff like that. And so if, uh, if we're having a worship service and uh, you see me keel over, uh, don't panic because it's okay. Now, that doesn't preclude you from coming up and doing CPR. That would be great, okay? <laughs> Go ahead and try to bring me back. It may not be my time, but if it is, you know, you don't have to cry about it. Uh, you can say, well, that's always how he wanted to go, so see you later. We need a new pastor. Um, that's the truth. All right, lastly, to fill in the blanks, Jesus had a very long-term view. The, uh, the Bible talks about him going to the cross because he looked forward to what he was uh, going to do by his sacrifice on the cross. He went to the cross for us. So that's thousands of years of looking forward to us when he suffered on the cross. All right, so I want to pick it up now in Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Jesus. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A woman's life does not, or a a man's life, or a woman's life. I guess maybe that was prophetic. I don't know. People's lives do not consist of the abundance of their possessions. And This is a a long passage that shows a lot of different things that we're going to talk about. But our possessions are are what this world is going after. They want to to get the most money they can so they can get the most things that they can or, or go on as many cruises as they can so they can have as much pleasures as they can. That's really the focus. And if you look at TV commercials, that's what the focus of the commercial is always about. Not always, but a lot of them are. Um, Jesus says, now be careful about that. Number 16, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. Now, I just want to pause for a second. What produced a good crop? The ground. Now, maybe he was good at planting. Maybe he fertilized really well. Maybe he watered it. I don't know what he did. Um, But the truth is, there are some things where God causes the increase to happen. God blesses the ground. The ground produced a good crop. And Jesus was careful to say it wasn't the guy who did this. It was the ground that did it. All right. Um, Jesus replied, oh, sorry. Go on. What shall I do? Oh, he thought to himself in verse 17, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Now, that was his first and only thought. I got a lot of stuff. Where can I store it? He didn't think, wow, wow. Who's, who's hungry that I might be able to feed with my extra crops? You know, who, what, what food pantry could I give my extra crops to to help people out? He only thinks, how can I store this for myself? Verse 18, then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. Whose goods? 
my goods, my grains. He obviously doesn't believe that God gives things to us. All good and perfect gifts come from above. Verse 19, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Um, So what is his, let's see, I think I used this term last week, your horizon for decision making. Is it real near term or is it far term? We're talking about are you nearsighted, you can see what's in front of you and that's it, or farsighted, you're looking ahead. What is his horizon to make decisions? He's thinking many years. Now, I guess that's better than the next hour, but he's thinking many years in that he won't have to work for many years. Now, I'm not that into farming, but it sounds like he's thinking, okay, look, I I spent a lot of hard work uh, planting stuff, and I'm going to reap stuff, and I I got so much in my barns, maybe I don't have to plant anything next year. I can take a year off, maybe two years off, maybe many years off, because now I've got so much that I don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's what he's thinking. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. This is where the term eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, I think I first heard this on some commercial or billboard or bumper sticker or something like that. Um, and it's, it's coming straight from Scripture, but it's not, Jesus isn't pointing to this guy and saying, yeah, we should all be like this, eat, drink, and be merry. No, he's saying eat, drink, and be merry is a very short-term way of looking at life. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Um, Now, I don't know if everybody's translation uses the same words for this. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. And I just have read that a hundred times, and I thought, okay, he's going to die tonight. God says, oh, you're going to die, so then who's going to get your stuff that you work so hard for and want to keep storing and all that kind of stuff? But this week, when I was preparing for this, I thought, that's a funny way of saying demanded of you. It's as if to say... I mean, if, if I was demanding something from you, I, may, I might say, hey, you know, I, I, I loaned you my, uh, my phone a couple minutes ago. Uh, I'd like it back now. Or you remember when I loaned you 100 bucks last week? Uh, I'd like it back now. I'm demanding something back that was given to you or, or loaned to you. And the picture here for me now is that God gave this man a life. And for us, he may have given us something saying, okay, now, I want you to use this to build my kingdom. I want you to use this life and all the talents and all the giftings that I've given you for good. And then when the man turns around and says, nah, you know, thanks for the life, but I'm going to just worry about myself from now on. It's like God says, well, I want it back then. I gave it to you, but now I want it back. His life is demanded of him. And I thought, what a picture. We know that God gives us life, right? That we weren't born out of happenstance. We were born for a purpose. We were born for mission. And we are called to do things. That doesn't mean that if I slip up one day, God's going to demand the life back. But I have to realize that this life ultimately belongs to God. He gave it to me. I messed it up. He went to the cross and and rebuilt the thing back together for me again, and now it belongs to him anyway. It always did, but it really does now. Demanded. All right. Verse 21. This is how it will be with everyone, or anyone, who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, and about your body, what will you, what will you wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add one single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these." If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown away, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? I want to pause for a second because this is another verse that grabbed me this week. God clothed the grass and the lilies of the field. Now, let that sink in for a minute. You know, if you're a botanist, you might say, well, you know, 
uh, plants. They take water from the soil and sunshine and photosynthesis and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's why the grass is green or, you know, my house plants are brown or whatever. Um, but ultimately, God clothed everything that we see outside, everything in nature. Um, I'm not a hiker, but we have some hikers in our congregation, and they just love being outside, being in the woods, hiking around, looking at stuff. And maybe one of the things that they see is the clothes that God bought the grass and the trees, and God decided that this is what grass should look like, and trees, and bushes, and all that. It was in God's mind that this is what he wanted things to look at, and you know, he's a creative God. He could have made every vegetable type thing look like grass, and that's what we'd be eating. He could make all people look alike. He could make all animals just one kind of animal, just dogs. But he's much more creative than that. I love, and you know this, I've talked about this all the time. I, when I'm at home and I'm flipping channels because I have nothing else to do and I want to watch TV, I seem to always stop on the, the Blue Planet shows. Uh, where they look at things in the ocean or they look at plants or now they've got one called Eden and the planet or something like that. And I think it's amazingly fascinating what kind of animals and plant life there is in this world. Some of it above ground, some of it uh, under the oceans. It's, and God thought all that up. I think that's amazing. So next time you're outside and you look at the grass, you can look at it and say, wow, God really did a good job with that. Look how green that is. Oh, look at that plant. Look at that tree. Look at those branches. That is beautiful. Okay, so he, he clothes the grass of the fields. Verse 29, And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. Runs after. That's a very active verb in the Greek. Runs after. It's not like, oh, yeah, I think I'll go to work so I can get a paycheck, you know, and buy stuff to eat. It's like they're running after. Runs after such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So he's just using uh, food and clothes. Now, we might use a bunch of other stuff. We might say, well, you know, I'd like to live in a house, or at least an apartment, or at least not under a bridge. And I might like to some kind of transportation. And you might have a list of things that you think are needs for you. But when this was written, the, the two big needs that we think of is food and clothing that they thought of. So Jesus used that as an example. And he draws pictures about the fields and the grass and all that food and clothing, food and clothing. And then he says now, at the end of the little passage here, if you seek the kingdom of God, you'll get all these other things. You won't even have to worry about them. Seek first the kingdom of God, and then these things will be added to you. Now, the kingdom of God is here, but the kingdom of God is also out there. It's also at the end of my life. It's when I step through the door from this life to the next life. The kingdom of God, I, I will notice it in its totality when I'm in the presence of God. The kingdom of God is something that I have to keep my eyes on farsightedness, not nearsighted. Nearsighted I might say, ooh, I like that shirt. That's the nicest one at Walmart I've seen yet. I'm going to buy that. Clothes, that's important. How about food? Oh, I think I'll stop at McDonald's or something. But the truth is, if I can keep my eyes farsighted, if I can keep my eyes on the kingdom of God and seek its growth and not worry so much about my own needs, it will happen. All right, but what if we give up all the good stuff, like stuff that we, the world is running after, and God doesn't give us the heavenly, really good stuff. And that's the question I had, let's be honest. Well, what if I, you know, if I don't go for the best job? What if I don't try to maximize all the money I have? What if I uh, just seek after the kingdom of God? What if I help other people to get what they need instead of what I need? What if I do all that and I don't get what I need? The next thing Jesus says in verse 32, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. It's like Jesus anticipated that that would be our fear. If I give everything up, are you really going to take care of me? Don't worry, little flock. The Father will give you the kingdom, and he's well pleased to give you the kingdom. It's what he wants to do. You can trust him. You can trust him. Verse 33, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out 
a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 35. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Isn't that interesting? He's shifting the focus now to a parable of when the master has gone from the house, and we're all housekeepers, we're all the master's servants, and we're taking care of things while he's gone, but eventually he's coming back. And Jesus says, now, make sure that you're ready, because he's going to come back. You're not sure when he's going to come back. Remember that this was written 2,000 years ago before cell phones and anything else. No texting. Hey, I'm on my way. I'll be there in five minutes. I'll be there in two minutes. I'll be there in one minute. I don't know why we have to know where everybody is every single minute, but there you go. It's, it's our culture right now. But when Jesus wrote this, somebody left and said, hey, I'll be back when I can, and the people taking care of the house said, okay, we'll keep an eye out for you. Jesus said, you better keep an eye out for you because when the master comes back, he's going to knock, and you want to get him in right away which means where are your eyes if you're going to let him in right away? Probably on the front door or over the hill or down the driveway, whatever it is. You want to be looking to where the master is going to come, not on what you happen to be excited about. That Oh, we're just going to watch TV. Do you hear a knock at the door? I don't hear a knock. I don't know. Okay, he's saying, no, keep an eye out. Verse 37, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself for service. And we'll have them recline at the table, and I will come and wait on them, or will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This whole story is really about Jesus coming back. And he says, now, I'm coming back, so don't spend all your time in front of the TV. I want you to look for my coming. I want you to see my coming. I want you to be ready when I come. And he is coming. And he doesn't say, I'm going to come at noon so you can see me down the road. He's going to come at the second or third watch of the night. The second watch, I don't know, midnight to three, the third watch, three to six, something like that. But it's like in the middle of the night. And if you think about, there's lots of verses that say that the day is almost over, or the night's almost over, the day is coming, the day is, I don't know how, but the picture is that in the last days, it's going to be a certain way, and when you read all those verses together about what it's going to be like in the last days, your only conclusion is, boy, we are in the last days right now. We may not be in the very last day, like he may not come back today after church, he may not come back tonight, this evening, he may come back at the second hour of the night tonight, or the third watch, if you want to. I don't know, but he's coming back soon, and when you look at everything that's taken place, he's coming back soon, 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 soon for us. He really is coming back soon. So this is the best time for us to be farsighted, to look not so much at the immediate things that we are running after, but at the kingdom of God and what Jesus is looking for us to do. All right, when I was a Christian, I have to scan and make sure we don't have too many young people here. Okay. Oh, maybe I have to turn my R-rated statement into PG-13. Okay. Uh, I just can't. I'm so sorry, parents. When I was a Christian teenager, we knew that premarital sex was wrong. But what was most on our heart as a question was, what about kissing? Is kissing wrong? Uh, a Christian young man, if I, if I like a girl... Is it okay to ask her out on a date? That was a big question. Uh, if we're out on a date, is it okay to kiss her, or is like that something that the Bible says don't do? And if someone says, yeah, yeah, you know, kissing is all right. Well, what about the making out, whatever that means to you? These were questions that, as a young teenage boy, were really on my mind. And so, um, was making out okay? Well, I had a youth leader when I was a teenager, brilliant guy, and he said, here's the way to figure out what's okay and what's not okay. And, you know, I was hoping for, like, illustrations or a hard and fast, okay, here's the line, don't cross it. But this is what he said. He said, don't do anything that you would be embarrassed for if Jesus came back while you were doing it. Now, here I am, no longer a teenager, okay? Y'all know that. 
And yet, I often think about that statement. Bill, what are you, what are you doing right now? Would you be embarrassed if Jesus came back and this is what he found you doing? So, if you're filling in the blanks, live each hour of your life as if Jesus could return right then. Live every hour of your life. The love of money over our love for God is a trap. The pursuit of money over our pursuit of God is a waste. A bank account full of money is nothing compared to a heart full of the Holy Spirit. First Timothy 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires. Now, watch the progression here because it starts by saying uh, people who want to get rich fall into foolish and harmful desires. It doesn't jump right into saying you're going to lose everything or you're, you're going to fall into the pit. It says you're going to fall into foolish and harmful desires. The desires are the first thing that plunge men into ruin and destruction. The progression is that we need to watch our hearts, our desires, because it's foolish and harmful desires that send us into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That same progression is there. It's the love of money that relates to um, the foolish and harmful desires. But then the, the harmful desires that plunge you into ruin and destruction are like the love of money, which plunges you into uh, wandering from the faith, being eager for money, wanders from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. Um, it doesn't say falls from the faith as if suddenly one day you've lost it all. It's more like wandering. Um, before I had a GPS and I was trying to drive somewhere, I would drive in the general direction of where I was going, and if I had general ideas in my mind where things were, I just sort of headed that way. But after a while, if I was lost, I was lost, and I was just wandering. Well, that's how it is if your desires don't line up with God's desires, because eventually your actions will not line up with what God wants us to do, and we begin to wander from the faith. And it's a, it's a slow process, and it can be deceiving. Check yourself. Pierce themselves. The verse 11, But you, man of God, flee from all this, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Flee from this. Flee from the wandering of the faith. Flee from the love of money. Flee from it. You know, it's another very active word in the Greek. It's not, you know, think about it. It's flee. Flee from it. Run and pursue, and then it gives you a list of things to pursue. It's equally active in the other direction. You're fleeing away from this, you're pursuing this. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Now, how many times have you read that verse? Fight the good fight of faith. And often when I think about it, I think about, oh, okay, in the last days we're going to be martyred and they're, they're going to come and, and say, do you believe in Jesus? If you do, I'm going to kill you. So we fight the good fight of faith. We say, yes, I believe. I stand up. Blah, blah, blah. But that's not the context of this verse. This context of this verse is all about not falling into to greed and short-term thinking, but pursuing the things that are in the kingdom of God and long-term thinking could this be the fight of faith that we're in? Could it be that we're not, you know, taking up uh, guns or swords or knives and fighting for Jesus, that what we're doing is fighting our own flesh to keep focused on the kingdom of God and not on our own desires, pleasures, and riches? Fight the good fight of faith. It doesn't say do your best for the fight of faith. It's fight it. Fight the fight. It, it's going to take an active role. You can't just sit there and hope that you don't fall into uh, these things. You have to fight for it. You have to fight for it. Take hold of the eternal life to which you've been called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. <sighs> Very confusing verse for me. When I, when I first read it years ago, I thought, take hold of eternal life? What do you mean? I gave my heart to Jesus. I, I have eternal life. 
What does it mean, take hold of eternal life? Well, I think what it means is eternal life is something that starts when you give your life to Christ. And it ends never. So eternal life starts when you're a Christian, and then it heads you right into eternity. That's eternal life. Now, if I want to grab hold of it, that means I'm letting go of things that are more right here in front of me, and I'm grabbing hold of eternal life. In other words, the thing that I want to hold on to, the things that I want to grab, the things that are important that have my focus and I, I want to follow through with is eternal life, my time with God after I'm out of here, my treasure that's in heaven, so to speak. And that verse that says, take hold of the eternal life, it's another very active verb take hold, like grab it, both hands, drop everything else you're holding, grab it, take hold of the eternal life to which you are called. It's kind of like the, the monkey bars. Did Chris show you a picture of the monkey bars when, when I was telling my gopher story? Uh, when you're holding on to those, you really have to hold on, right? Now, if you're really strong and good, you can let go with one hand to grab the next bar and swing and, you know, but you, you got to hold on. Because if you're up there on the monkey bars and you're not holding on, what happens? You just fall. All right. All right. Take hold of eternal life means putting his eternal life at the front of your mind, not money at the front of your mind. Filling in the blanks. Keep the kingdom of God in the forefront of your mind. Colossians 3. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is, uh, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There's two things there. Set your hearts on things above. Often in Scripture, when it talks about your heart, it's talking about your emotions, your commitments, your will, what, what do you live for? What are you really feeling? Uh, set your heart on things above. And then it says, set your minds on think of things above. So we're talking about your emotions and your thinking. And he could say, set your actions on things above, only do the things you're supposed to do. But he really focuses in on our feelings and what we're thinking about. Because truthfully, what you're feeling and what you're thinking ends up to be what you're doing. Right? And Set your minds on things above. Okay, Second Peter. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to your goodness knowledge, to your knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind." and has forgotten that he has cleansed himself from past sins. If you want to know where I got this idea that we should be farsighted, it's right here. Because if you don't have all these things, the things that God's trying to do for you, the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you are nearsighted. You can only see what's right in front of you. And unfortunately, even worse than nearsighted, you're blind. Okay, stay farsighted. Being nearsighted is being blind. That's what goes in the blank. Stay farsighted. Being nearsighted is being blind. Do you know when I was uh, 16 or 15, we had to take a test to get our learner's permit to drive a car. And uh, the one question that I got wrong on the test, which was okay, I think we could miss five and still pass. But it's still, I wanted to get them all right. That's pretty much me all over. The one question I got wrong is they showed a picture of a car on a highway and other cars in front of it. And it said, how far ahead should you look? And I hadn't studied that in the little booklet. So I thought, well, you know, you don't want to run into the car in front of you. Uh, so I picked the answer, which was the car right in front of me. And it was wrong. They wanted you to look a little past the car that's in front of you. Now, would that be a good thing? Well, if that car slammed on his brakes because something was happening in front of him, it might be a good idea if you knew that ahead of time. Because by the time the car in front of you slams on your brakes, you have to be really quick to slam on your brakes and not hit him. So that was my one answer that I got wrong the first time, I think the only time I took that test. Well, here we are as Christians, we need to be farsighted too. Um, all right, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? 
Some translations say soul. 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. We fix our eyes on what is unseen, the eternal. Outwardly, we're wasting away. You know, Paul wrote this, and Paul wasted away in, pre- in prison. He was beaten all the time. Uh, his outward body was wasting away. But he says, that's okay, because inwardly, the really important part, it's growing day by day. And I'm going to grow right into my eternal life. I'm going to grow into the presence of God, and I'm going to go, ooh, here I am, finally. And, and I can tell you, I'm getting older, and the, the outside is wasting away. But hopefully, I'm not so focused on my outside that I miss what's happening on the inside. Amen. All right. By faith, we see our beautiful destiny in the distance. And I, I just wanted to end on a positive note. Um, when I talk about being farsighted, when I talk about grabbing hold of the eternal life, living our life, uh, knowing that it's only the first part of, an, of a very long life without end. This is what we look forward to. From Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Most funerals I do, I try to include that passage. Um, especially for a Christian who died. Because I love that last line. The old order of things has passed away. What's the old order of things? We're born, we live, we die. But that's passed away now. Now we're born, we live a little, we get reborn, we live forever. The old order of things has passed away. We used to try to gather everything into our life to make us happy, Now we give things away to make God happy. The old order of things has passed away. If you can, stand up with me. I just want to pray for us. Heavenly Father, we are here because we love you. We love each other and we love worshiping you together. Father, we pray that you continue to give us that far-sighted view of the kingdom of God. Help us to realize that your values should be our values, that the things you care most about are the things that we ought to care most about. Lord, this separates us from those who do not know you. Father, we pray that we would take each step in life as if you could return that day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen. Hey, I would also mention that um, I was talking to Jamie last night. I don't know where she heard this, 
but she said, uh, Bill, there was an underground church in, in Afghanistan that had like 100 members. And last week, 1,400 members showed up. So um, if they don't get out, I pray that the, the church of God in Afghanistan would rise up. But I'd rather see them alive. All right, thank you.